So, by way of introduction, my name's Ross. I've made, we, made, we made about four or five years ago now called Four Horsemen. Has anyone seen Four Horsemen in here? One person. I love you. Uh, you're great. You can stay. The rest of you, where were you? Um, uh, so, uh, Four Horsemen, basically what we did was we likened um, four, four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, because that's uh, something which is in people's minds, uh, and we hung our modern day problems on those four, uh, on the Four Horsemen. Um, the, uh, by, uh, my pedigree, if you like, is I, I went to uh, uni to be a farmer. I know not many people do that. Um, and then ended up as a filmmaker. And I know that is a, a bit of a, a jump. But when you start looking and when you start to hear about the economics when it comes to land specifically, uh, and you start to ask fundamental questions about land, uh, you then, and that happens at Agricultural College, uh, that means uh, that you are led down a rabbit hole, excuse the pun, uh, and then you start understanding the economic system for what it is. And hopefully what I want to do to, uh, in the next 20 minutes is go through that with you in relation to austerity uh, and, and give some context. When you're stuck in an economic system, it's very, very difficult to get out of it to be able to see it cl uh, plainly and clearly. And I would argue that at the moment we are all stuck in an economic system. Austerity... Uh, and the narrative of austerity, uh, in my view, is little more than what's called shock therapy. Uh, and we can go back to Chile, we can go to Margaret Thatcher, we can go to all these different politicians. But the one um, residing, if you like, and, 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 and universal trait with all of them is that it isn't actually the politics. Yes, they enforce it, but actually it's the economics behind it. So um, we've done a bit of pedig... I'm going to have to keep jumping back here. That's Four Horsemen and Renegading, uh, if you want Twitter handles, and, and um, that's the film uh, brand. If, uh, and it's on YouTube, in fact. You can find it there. So what I'd suggest, if, if it is the... Um, uh, if it isn't just the politics and the politicians, because really they're interchangeable, whoever you put in place, the same sort of systems carry on. What we are involved in is a spectator democracy. And I want to get away from the old language, which is left versus right, socialism versus capitalism, and in fact, any other isms. Because, again, they are, in my view, a colossal, colossal distraction, as is this really simplistic way of painting something red and painting something blue. Uh, we're beyond that, in my view. And, but the question is... Uh, where are we? Well, uh, if we take austerity, if we agree that austerity is shock therapy, uh, then what, uh, and we define shock therapy, it's a sudden and drastic measure or measures taken to solve an intractable problem. Now, here's the key point. Uh, as you already know, and I'm not telling you stuff that you haven't thought about, it's not going to work. Austerity is not going to work. It's going to work for 1% but it isn't going to work for everybody uh, in the slightest. And until we organize around the reasons why it isn't going to work, we will demonstrate and we will protest, but we won't, in my view, demonstrate smart and protest smart. We have to understand what the glitch is in the system and the historical context of that glitch. Um, so why, why impose it, and why is it last-ditch uh, uh, moment of the, the neoliberal paradigm? Well, the reason to impose it is to re-establish a class system. We've had an incredibly, at times since uh, World War II, incredibly progressive social policy. And all that's being ripped up and binned. Uh, and the reason to do that is because the 1% or the, the rent-seeking, uh, the rent-seekers, uh, the neoliberal types, the bankers... The, the landlords, uh, all the people that we know, the parasites fundamentally, who are sucking uh, rents out of the system, know that it's easier to manage a hierarchy, it's easier to reimpose a tax system and, uh, and kick the poor for doing that. Because if uh, in 2008 the blame wasn't given uh, where it should have been given, which is to speculators, to rentiers, to the bankers, to the, to even to the, 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 the usurers, all those people, if the blame was put there, uh, they would have to admit in some way that there was something faulty with this neoliberal ideology. And it is an ideology, even though it doesn't, it doesn't claim it is. So what's the idea? Will you impose austerity and you say to the poor, you know what, it's your fault, you're not working hard enough. It's absolute nonsense. It's easier, of course, to uh, manage a steep alienating hierarchy. Prison officers will tell you this. It's easier to manage a, a steep alienating hierarchy uh, than it is um, an e ecosystem, if you like. Uh, and what is a steep alienating hierarchy? It's a byproduct of a low trust environment. So these corporate structures that you see now, which are very, very uh, steep, and there's one person at the top apparently calling the shots, 
Uh, that's because fundamentally there's absolutely no trust in those environments. And it's funny when you start to see uh, a more holistic business, often at employee-owned businesses, that they're much more dynamic, they're anti-fragile, and trust capital is, is really, really high. I know where I'd prefer to work. <clears throat> so you move the bill to the core poor, uh, and what happens, there's an upward redistribution of wealth. Uh, and I'm sure this isn't something that you haven't thought about. The main uh, function of austerity is hidden in plain sight. Uh, and that's the best way to do things because then, and you can call somebody a conspiracy loony if they start to call it out. But the point is, it's to extend, or well, to defend and extend this neoliberal ideology. Neoliberalism, this is a glib definition, but I quite like it. It's mine. Uh, a wasteful economic ideology that rationally justifies the worst aspects of human behavior. I think that you can think, and ladies and gentlemen, you are ahead of most economists. I just want to uh, digress quickly. A lot of you might be sitting, or some of you might be sitting here now thinking, God, he's talking about economics. I haven't got an economics degree. I can't, this is a problem. No, you're at a total and utter advantage to any economist, neoclassical economist in the world now. And I tell you why. Neoclassical e economics that is taught in every Ivy League university in the world is basically like a frontal lobotomy. You have to have a, 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 some kind of, you have to have something wrong to be able to digest all that stuff in, uh, in Economics 101 and those courses and then try and apply it to the real world. How do we know? It's very simple. Professor Louis Garricano at the London School of Economics was once asked by Her Majesty the Queen just after 2008, did anybody see it coming? Very, very simple question, arguably naive. And of course, he's that left red-faced uh, without an answer. Why? Because uh, crises aren't in their models. And think of the hubris. If it's not in my models, it's not going to happen. What right uh, does any economist have to be able to determine the fate of the rest of society? Answer, none. Big problem with neoclassical economists. They can't unlearn. Their mind has been so bent to these models and these uh, ideologies they can't unlearn. So man or woman on the street uh, are often at a much bigger advantage because you don't have to go through that unlearning pro process. And the key point is this. When these people, these neoclassical types, say to you, you're making it too simple, do not listen. It is very simple. And the reason why the language is so convoluted, so dense, so tiresome, is because they have to defend their bullshit up at all costs because the emperor has no clothes. It's the biggest story in town, and as a filmmaker, it was the biggest story that I've ever come across. That neoclassical economics is fundamentally broken. There's a couple of bits which are okay. The rest of it is a total and utter disaster. Do not be put off. And I think the unlearning process is more difficult. You, uh, many of you don't have to go through that. So the problem, the big problem is the neoliberals say, well, we don't have an ideology. We're over ideology. John Major said it. Ideology is gone. Tony Blair said it. Ideology. We don't have ideology anymore. That's total and utter rubbish. We have a, a, a rent-seeking ideology. We have a, a, an ideology that glorifies extractive industries whether that's fossil fuels or, or taking rents out of society. That's what we have. And that is an ideology that doesn't dare speak its name. So this idea that we haven't got ideology is utter rubbish. And the reason why they say we haven't got ideology is because uh, the best way to have, uh, to, to have a, a profit-driven ideology is never ever to name it because you can fight something that's named. Something that's formless is almost impossible to fight. The point is we can play the same game. So fight the nothingness. I saw this post, it was excellent. Uh, and th these guys, whoever they are, are onto something. Neoliberalism, this is their definition. This is the ideological definition that the neoliberals have. It's a free market economic philosophy. Philosophy that favors deregulation of markets, industries, the diminution of taxes and tariffs, and the privatization of government functions, passing them over to private business. Recognize that? So are we, are we broadly on, on the right track? Milton Friedman, yes? Chicago boys, all, all about that? Great. Um, so the idea is that human beings are rational. Well, I've just watched these marathon runners. <laughs> human beings aren't rational. Uh, and self-interested. And that's rubbish too. Uh, because, and what we've seen with celebrity culture over the last uh, 25 years is that being self-interested is not the path to happiness. 
And if you uh, read the, the first paragraph of Moral Sentiments by Adam Smith, the classical f uh, economist who actually described himself as a moral philosopher, you can, you, he says in, it, in the first paragraph that this self-interested thing is, is rubbish because there is something in everybody's nature when they help somebody else that, that they benefit from. And it's serving a cause greater than yourself. But that has all been lost because apparently we're rational and totally self-interested. Again, not to be believed. So this ideology, this neoliberal ideology, falls at its first plank. Its first plank. And it's why we have such a problem with mental health, I think, in the Western world. It's one of the reasons. Government is efficient, inefficient and costly. Again, not true. Think of what happened with Google. The U.S. government poured millions and millions and billions and billions and billions in, into researching how to create a great search engine. And then those guys came along and privatized it and scraped the profits. It happens all the time. You get, as a drug company, you make sure the government does your research for you. Then and they take all the losses and then you put it in the private market and take the rents. You can see the pattern. Private business is efficient and the best way to solve our problems. Well, if you've ever worked in a private business, we had a, cli a client, one of the big four banks, who will name, remain, remain nameless, Barclays. Absolutely, absolutely the most inefficient, dismal, toxic workplace I've ever, ever come across. And we were a, pro we were a client to them. I came back to the office one day and said, we have to get rid of these people because they'll take us down with, with them. Uh, really, uh, th th this is not the case that private business is efficient and the best way to solve our problems. In fact, far from it. And remember that Thatcher, you know, under her breath in number 10, when someone said to her, Margaret, you know, you've been incredible. What was your uh, biggest achievement? She said new labor. We have never really got rid of Milton Friedman, Margaret Thatcher, General Pinochet, Tony Blair. And now we've got Cameron and now we've got Osborne. So Thatcher, really, uh, and new labor and, and, this, uh, and this ideology... Uh, it is, is, is here now, and, it, and, it's, and it's never been worse, ever. And it's all based on this. That, and, I mean, if you want to come, if you want simplistic thinking, I mean, Alan Greenspan swears by this. He thinks that everything happens because human beings are rational and don't run marathons or run marathons or whatever it is, that, that everything happens in that line, in that cross. So, every, so the economy is a self-regulating thing. You lot don't need to worry about it because everything happens according to this chart. And the Excel spreadsheet, all the cells on those Excel spreadsheet, which by the way are you, all that can be fed into this and everything can happen in equilibrium just there. I mean, do you want anything more ridiculous and more simplistic? And this is neoliberalism. The, self, the economy is a self-regulating entity that always finds equilibrium. Equal, e equilibrium. Rubbish. Found this. I can't pronounce his name. Um, but the straight line is godless and immoral. And it's true. And if you've ever tried doing anything in life, you know, child rearing, your own job, passing a driving test, how are many things going a straight line? Answer zero. Absolutely zero. We need the jaggedness of human beings. What we don't want to do is sanitize them so they all become unikit. And we become a monoculture, which is what's happened and is happening. And no one likes it. So where do straight line, why do, sorry, why do straight lines haunt the economy, uh, haunt economic theory and the economy? That, well, people believe, the neoliberals believe that society is no more than the sum of its parts. That to understand the whole, all you have to do, all you have to do is connect the dots uh, and that the interactions between human beings are either zero or negligible. The interactions between human beings are the things that make us human. That's why loneliness is so ter is, is uh, why we have such an epidemic of loneliness now, especially in the West. Neoliberalism is a recently formed simplistic ideology that expects the worst of human beings and validates value extraction. By using selective economic modeling and clear social prejudice, it deregulates and disenfranchises citizens. <coughs> Should be all citizens. By labeling uh, the state inefficient and fetishizing the so-called free market, neoliberalism encourages politicians to use legislation that puts public property in private hands. It runs on crony capitalism, uh, encouraging, without limit, the rentier economy. And this means that under the banner of efficiency, community-created value, the stuff that you all create when you go about your lives, uh, unearned income and economic rent, rent can be legally funneled into private bank accounts, often held offshore. 
John Kay, the economist, uh, 2009, slipped up and said it. Uh, you can become wealthy by creating wealth or by appropriating the wealth created by other people. That is their game. That is the austerity game. It's the last ditch effort to push this neoliberal agenda. When the appropriation of wealth is illegal, it's called theft. When it's legal, and it is legal, Goldman Sachs legally go about their business. The, uh, economists call it rent-seeking. Rent-seeking is about skimming off the share of wealth created by others. So when you feel that total injustice, and you don't really know uh, because, you, because of the formlessness of this ideology, when you feel that total injustice, this is the process. This is the underlying process that's going on. This rent-seeking, it's apportioning the wealth, often created by you, and paying CEOs, astronomical... I mean, Mike Ashley at, at Sports Direct, the way he runs that business, and in comparison to his pay packet. And if you want me to give you a diametrically opposed business, Patagonia, still make good money, excellent trust in that business, very ethical, and they go out on Black Friday and they say, please don't buy our stuff. Only buy it if you need it. You wouldn't see him, him see that. I mean, look at the state of Newcastle Football Club. These people will go down in history as worse than the uh, Victorian workhouse type because we've moved on. We didn't really have the knowledge back then. We have the knowledge now. It's important that we talk about it. And just so I'm not some conspiracy loony, because they do tell you that's how people marginalize you, I tweeted Jeffrey Sachs, the, um, the guy who Bono wrote the forward to his book for. He, uh, no one's perfect. Um, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, Bono, Bono, Bono. Um, and I said to him, you know, Prof Sachs, what's your view on rent seeking? Looking forward to hearing it. And he says about the, and, and this is an eminent man, right? He's been in, in government, he's, he's respected. And he says the US political economy is now built on rent seeking, finance, military, industrial complex, healthcare, and fossil fuels. If you want a, an absolute coup, these neoliberals have done an, an awesome, awesome job. That Mont Pelegrin society back 45 years ago when they said we've got to get this right and use Frederick Hyatt and we've got to get funded and we've got to fund all the think tanks, we've got to fund the universities, we've got to fund Chicago. We sent the Chicago boys to Chile, Milton Friedman, and look what happened there. And it's still alive and kicking. Thankfully, um, we're on to it. And then I said, well, it's really edifying to hear such honesty about uh, rent-seeking in the US from um, at Jeff Sachs. This is where we focus our attention, I'm sure you agree. And he says, yep, our political system it has become utterly corrupted, both parties. It's a disgrace and at huge cost to the American people. And he, by the way, is on now on the team for Bernie Sanders, along with Stephanie Kelton and, and, and that lot. And the reason why you're seeing uh, a rise in, in people like uh, Sanders, who I think is an absolutely f fine individual, never once compromised his morals and where he stands. And that little bird moment, if you saw it, when he was making that speech, was really special. Um, probably the best thing that's happened in American politics in the last 50 years. Um, uh, then uh, you, you, the rise of these people is because man on the street, the people who have been victim of rent-seeking, um, have had enough. And this is really the mechanism, this is how it works. Social, so you go about your lives, social enterprise and, and work, which means that services get better, infrastructure gets improved, new technologies, etc. This increases the quality of life, because everyone see this. Uh, and then uh, communities become more desirable to live in, obviously. Uh, if you think about what's happened in Peckham, uh, what's happening in Peckham, all the hipsters move in, all the creative moves in, uh, then the rents start to go up. Why? Because community uh, value starts to go up or economic rent starts to go up. Then that gets privatized. You then start to see wealth inequality, poverty, taxation, fines, and social unrest once the um, gentrifiers have moved on, the property developers have moved on. And then you have the social and economic issues, not least inequality. And that's really gentrification. Why? Because no freeholder obligation. Freeholders don't have an obligation. Why? Because the whole economy works in equilibrium. So if you don't have an... Uh, 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 if you, if you w listen, watch that Kirsty Allsop and all those people who are just flipping houses all the time and driving the houses' prices up and up and up. And then, the and then what is the logical progression of that? Gated communities. You have economic apartheid. Why? Because it becomes a pay-to-play economy. So you need, in every uh, 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 um, uh, uh, mature democracy, some kind of freeholder obligation, which would mean the community-created value isn't privatized into property values and then extracted, often uh, into places like Panama or the British Virgin Islands. Um, 
Now, everyone has to put their hand in their pocket and say, I want to live in that kind of society, not the one where, you know, Kirsty Allsop is, is, is hero worshipped. Or sitting at dinner parties saying, my house has gone up 26% in the last four, four years. And taking credit for it. What, because you painted the walls magnolia and put a wood floor in it? <laughs> like, you didn't do that. But this hyper-individualism, they go, yeah, yeah, I did it. No, no, it's the schools, it's the infrastructure, it's the National Health Service, it's access to decent water, it's, 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 every, it's, a, it's living in a society. And here's a key point. We don't live, ladies and gentlemen, in an economy. Politicians will tell you we live in an economy. No, no, we live in a society. We should live in a society, and the economy should serve that society. What's happened is it's capsized, and apparently we live in an economy. This is a massive mistake. This is the real uh, um, mechanism uh, of our ills. And what is it? Well, it's a free lunch. So the economic rent or the economic surplus today is being drained by landlords, bankers, and bondholders. So when, uh, when uh, uh, countries go bust, and at the moment, you know, <laughs> how long have you got? Greece. The reason the Germans uh, are in, into Greece is because the Greek taxpayers... Uh, the, the, German, well, well, the, the German government want the Greek taxpayers on the hook. And that's the bondholder at the bottom here. I'll tell you a story at the end about Yanis. I was with Yanis Varoufakis recently. And, he's, a good, and uh, he's such a good guy, by the way. What you see is what you get. And um, he told me a very interesting story about Larry Summers. Or two, so. And here is Larry Summers. Uh, that's him there on the right. Uh, this is Rob Rubin. Both of them got rid of Glass-Steagall in the U.S., and Alan Greenspan was so badly influenced by Anne Rand, who was diametrically opposed to what Adam Smith came up with, the, the economist. And he said, you know, Larry Summers has said, and it's a massive admission from him, the United States now is well on the way to becoming a Downton Abbey economy. Uh, and I'm not up for living below stairs, if you hadn't noticed. So Adam Smith uh, long ago remarked that profits often the highest and nations fastest going to ruin. There are many ways to create economic suicide on a national level. The major way throughout history has been to in-debt the economy. Debt always expands to reach the point where it can't be paid by large swathes of the economy. That is the point where austerity is Im imposted uh, and ownership of wealth polarizes between the 1% and the 99%. And this is from Professor Michael Hudson, who I really recommend. He's written a book called Killing the Host, which is fantastic. So what we've got to do is make this distinction, remake this distinction between earned wealth and unearned wealth. Because that is the crux of the problem. If your house price has gone up by 25%, 80%, 200%, whatever it is, there'll be a, a, a lot of that money which is unearned. Naturally. If a CEO is getting paid 2,000 times what the average worker is being paid, all of that is economic rent. That is unearned wealth. You're not telling me that CEO does a shift which is two and a half thousand times more potent than a bloke on the factory floor. How can he? She. And this is the big issue. So the classical economists basically made the distinction between earned and unearned income. And earned income and, and uh, or income derived that was earned, they talked about. Income that was derived that was unearned, they talked about. And they made that distinction because that was the way to becoming, uh, to having a progressive society. And morally it was right. I mean, Adam Smith, he was a moral philosopher. He didn't think of himself as an economist. And what happened was this guy came along, John Bates Clark. And what, before he tipped up with this bloody book, the commonality between all classical economists, not neoclassical, classical, was the distinction between earned income and unearned income. Right? He comes along and says there's no distinction between earned income and unearned income. It's all the same. Well, you can imagine what happened when he said that. All the landlords, all the bankers, all the rent seekers, all the people who sat idly on their behind and didn't do an honest shift said, fund him. And it also happened with Herbert Spencer. In Social Statics, his book, his famous book, in the first edition, he said land was a unique factor of production. Not just a factor of production, a unique factor of production. In the second book, after he's been wined and dined by the aristocracy, no mention of land. Go to any economics textbook now in any Ivy League university. Any. And go to the back. See how many entries there are for la uh, labor. See how many entries there are for capital. And see how many entries there are for land. Three factors of production, land, labor, capital. Somehow, neoclassical economists have totally written land out of the equation. 
So how on earth are you going to iron out housing booms and busts if you're not looking at the key factor of production? You're not. And some of that blame, a lot of that blame, goes down to this guy. And as soon as the landlord saw it, as soon as the aristocracy saw it, they said, fund this. So today, if we're going to retrieve our economies and ultimately our democracy, because the democracy that's really at threat, what we have to do, once again, is to recognize the difference between earned and unearned increment income or, uh, or rent. We may realize that inflating prices of things that currently exist is really, really unproductive. Can you see there? Sorry. So if we're uh, 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 constantly inflating or reflating the housing market, we realize that that is a total and utter waste of productive capital. That capital could be uh, pushed into biotech research. It could go into creating enterprise parks where entrepreneurs don't pay rent until they uh, start making some money and then they put a portion of their uh, income or, or their profits towards the landlord. It could go to anything. It could go to the NHS. I mean, imagine that. And this is in March 2015, and, you know, it's so innocuous. People don't think that there's in interrelationship here. On one side, you've got this reflation of the housing market, which is this help-to-buy disaster, a total and utter social disaster. This is selling Britain out. And you've seen now in London what's happened. Every uh, dodgy uh, regime globally has bought a flat there. They don't need help to buy, but the people at the bottom do, um, insofar as... Uh, the, you get them in debt and get them paying rent to the banks. And on the same page of, the, of this section of the Times uh, in 2.15 March, poorers can't eat, food minister admits. These two things are linked. And if we, and, and, and if we go back to the neoliberal idea, they're not. Of course they are. So we've got to get rid of it. This neoliberal or, or neoclassical economics, and it's going to be harder than um, a few presentations and a few films and all the rest of it. But there are a, great, a growing number of people, and thankfully uh, students, who've had enough. There are also some brilliant professors out there, Herman Daly, Professor Steve Keem, Professor Michael Hudson. Lots and lots of guys who are leading the charge, heterodox economists, who've really said enough's enough. And of course, the most tragic thing, if we come back to happiness and fulfillment, is that consumers were born. And that is the neoliberal wet dream. Keep people dependent. Don't have them think for themselves. Don't have them make for themselves. Keep them, keep them coming back to the teat of the mall uh, and, and watching the glass teat at home and, and fill them through advertising, mad men uh, type advertising. Fill them with affluenza and hope that they keep, come and part with their hard-earned money. And I don't really blame people, you know. A lot of people want that escapism because life's bloody tawdry at times. And also when people see these Black Friday sales and everyone's killing each other to get hold of a, the latest plasma, uh, I don't really blame them either because those people, and often in America you see it, you know, their wages have been so smashed to pieces. Their one bit of enjoyment is to have, because uh, 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 so, they like television, that is, is to have that. So if they're there kicking each other around to get the best deal, it's structurally determined behavior, not prejudice. I mean, Christ, imagine living in that house. Like, stuff, <laughs> you know, can you put the rubbish out? Yeah. Have you got a Louis Vuitton? Have you got a Louis Vuitton bin bag? <laughs> yeah, I'll put it in that. All right. Put it out the front. Put it two days before the bin, the bin men arrive. Why? So the neighbors can see. All right. So uh, I'm not coming here just to uh, beat it all up. I mean, it needs a good kicking. But what I'm coming here is to say that we can replace it with something which is far more wholesome. Uh, and there is light at the end of the tunnel because this really is on its last legs. It's just we need to kick it over. So the Manifesto Renegade Inc., um, which is the successor brand to Four Horsemen, if you like. And what we, we've just crowdfunded recently. We see a huge uh, amount of demand in the, in the market uh, for uh, us to create an organization that talks like this and also creates businesses that actually add value. So what we want uh, on a, I think it's an eight-point um, plan, is clear language. Oh, by the way, uh, whilst there's value for some people for the practices on the right, that's the 1%, if you haven't got that, uh, then, uh, we feel that the principles on the left are more valuable to everybody, society. So the first would be clear language over confusing words and concepts. Back in the day, the guilds used Latin, you know, the lawyers and the, and the doctors, because they needed to protect their IP. And that's what's happening with the bankers today. They use collateralized debt obligation. They can't explain it. Cocos. Does anyone know what a cocoa is? NERP. 
ZERP, TARP. All these acronyms are total bullshit. They're, they're, they, they, they're, you might as well say about all of them taking taxpayers' money to prop up a defunct system which doesn't deliver value anymore because it's become so extractive. So what I want is, or what we want collectively, is clear language over confusing words and concepts. The real economy over the rent-seeking economy. Now, the rent-seeking economy does serve 1%, but the real economy serves everybody. And there's way that, and it's a design job, it's an engineering job, that you can actually design the economy that you want, and then you go and get the economists to say, and say to them, deliver that. Not, it, like, you know, not the economists do what you want. Who's, whose payroll are you on? You watch Inside Job, that guy who wrote destability uh, uh, stability in Iceland. And then afterwards, he changed his thesis. He's getting paid 75 grand. Are you for real? So the real economy over the rent-seeking economy. I'm not a big fan of, uh, of the Rontiers. Distribution of opportunity over monopoly. Very few people know that monopoly, the game, was actually invented by a Quaker woman uh, to uh, show uh, what happens when uh, you start privatizing land rent. Now, I don't know how many of you have played Monopoly, but it doesn't end well, ever. And introduce a bottle of Malbec and a few gin and tonics to it, and you will find that next morning people aren't talking to each other. <laughs> what happened? The Parker brothers came along, they saw Monopoly, they thought, bloody hell, we'll appeal to people's self-interest here. There's a game in this. So what should have been used to teach people about the pernicious nature of rent-seeking actually was converted and sold to people's naked self-interest and ambition. It's, the irony is fantastic, right? So what I want is distribution of opportunity over monopoly. And it's not, by the way, redistribution of wealth. And let me explain that. If you put the Rontier class in charge of something, they don't last very long because they're crap at it. They're not very good at people skills. They're not very good at innovation. They haven't used those skills. They haven't needed to. They're shooting pheasants and collecting rent. That's what they're doing, broadly. So when you start putting people, and the people's Eton, I mean, Eton School, right? They came up with, the, they've got an academy which is Eton. They've caned, from an exam uh, um, the point of view, they've absolutely beaten the, the other guys, or certainly on a par with them in the median. So I want distribution of opportunity and, and, set, and to set the economy free and get, and get us moving again. Key point, access to education over a commoditized education market. This legislation that's going through through the finance bill at the moment is basically putting the academies across the UK. That is a disaster. It's a total and utter disaster, and it's so neoliberal. I tell you now, if you've got kids, they're being privatized. Because those kids going through those systems, when you own the means of production, and you own and the outcomes, and you own the national curriculum, you can say what you want. And you'll bend little minds into what, they, into what older people or people who need to defend this system need them to think. Now, economics in university has, has been... To economic history is gone. You know, no one knows that in 1907, Cambridge University divorced the moral sciences from teaching economics. No one knows that. Well, you don't think they're interlinked? When Adam Smith was a moral philosopher, the godfather? When he, opened, when he writes a book called the, the Theory of Moral Sentiments? Of course they're intertwined. So what do you do? You get it in the kids early. And you say, this is the market. It works in equilibrium. You get on with it and don't question anything. And that, I'm not, that's not happening. So Henry VIII was the famous crony capitalist. He did exactly the same things to the monasteries. And uh, that, if you really want to take up a battle and you really want to get traction, talk to people about their kids being privatized. And from a human right point of view, a commoditized education market is lunacy. I mean, it's lunacy. Access to education and self-paced learning because people get to learning at their own speeds. Not this curriculum stuff where you're burning kids out. There's bloody suicide everywhere. Absolutely wrong. Key point. Real wealth and value creation uh, over the creation of money and debt. People now increasingly know that banks create money out of thin air and lend it an interest. That's a good thing. Profit is a byproduct of good business as opposed to profit as a motive because we've seen the problem, it's all self-explanatory. Key point here, coll uh, collaboration and collectivism over egotistical self-interest and individualism. You know, and, and again, this comes back to Adam Smith versus Anne Rand. Anne Rand was a nut job. She, uh, you know, she really was, and, and sadly, Greenspan listened to her for 25 years. 
And then lastly, I'm just conscious of, of the time, uh, and because I want to get to questions, timeless universal principles over ad hoc man-made protocol and laws. We have got to realize that we uh, are, I got it, uh, we, uh, that natural law, whether you like it or not, whether there's lobbying or not, natural law, the environment, exists. And if you start breaking those natural laws, all sorts of bad things happen and will continue to happen. And we've become so egotistical and, uh, and, and the hubris is so great that we think that we can bypass natural law. Oh, well, we'll just burn fossil fuels, but if we just put a solar farm up, it'll be all right. No, 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 you've got to work with nature. And it's obviously uh, eco versus ego. And we have to push back because it hasn't made us very happy. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I present to you cohort C. When we made Four Horsemen, my wife made a brilliant observation. I think it was in Zurich, which is ironic because it's full of bankers, that screening. Um, and um, she said, our audience aren't a generation. Because what can happen here is we can say the baby boomers versus Generation X versus, I think the millennials is such a terrible term. Do you know, how, why do you call someone a millennial? Um, and, uh, but my wife, Megan, who's a, who produced Four Horsemen, she said, our, gener our uh, audience aren't a generation it's, or a demographic. Sorry, guys, I've only just realized you're here. I've been looking out here. So, um, <laughs> I just saw you there. So, um, our, our audience are a mindset. It's not about when they were born. It's not about their socioeconomic environment. It, it's not about any of that. They want collaboration. They want community. They want community creative value. They, and, and, and they're everywhere. Every time we took the film out, I dare say, and we called them Cohort C, and that C is, uh, I think, a new force in citizenship. Uh, or, or you can have it as collaboration. But this cohort uh, want causes, and they, and they want, uh, they want the, the kind of unity that society doesn't have at the moment because of the unfettered self-interest that we've had to endure. So cohort C, our view, an attitude, a state of mind, and it will be and is a uh, powerful new force in citizenship. I dare say you're part of that cohort, uh, and what we need to do is talk increasingly. It's fine social media, and it's fine filling your news feeds with anti-Tory propaganda, uh, but the most important job, which Sam's done today, is get people in a room and to talk to one another and swap ideas and have that kind of uh, exchange. So uh, it's not all bad, but it, it is on a knife edge. You've got to kick over the neoliberal ideology. The academization of schools uh, should be really top of the list because uh, people who can't yet defend themselves, uh, you have to defend. Moral obligation. Um, and, um, and we'll win. But it'll, but it'll be a fight. Uh, but it'll be good fun. I think, uh, because when you've got the truth, or when you have authenticity, uh, you're in a much stronger position. Jumping on the poor to get the poor and the middle class to infight, and the immigrants was not a viable, is not an, a viable strategy to prolong an economic system. I can tell you that. Um, so watch the film, watch Four Horsemen, make that distinction between, um, between unearned and earned increment uh, rent uh, or income. And um, let's fight on. Uh, we are at Renegade Inc. Please follow us. Also, my uh, Twitter handle here. And Four Horsemen, as I said, is available on YouTube for free. Uh, and, and that's it. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.